Welcome to the city of Kent, Ohio. It's easy to think of Kent as just another city with a college, just another anonymous place on the map. Every day, people walk, ride, and drive by the landmarks that define the city and its rich history. Why are they here? Where do they come from? Who built it? What made Kent the city it is today? Everything from the river and canals to the mills and railroads has played a key role in the development of the city and the region. Kent, the early years. Thousands of years ago, an ice age covered the land. Glaciers formed and covered all of what we now know as Northeast Ohio. They scraped across the land, creating rivers and lakes. One of these rivers now flows through Kent, the Cuyahoga. The Cuyahoga River drew people to the area long before Europeans settled the land. Before they were forced west by early settlers, Native Americans lived in the region for the abundance of fish, game, and transportation provided by the Cuyahoga River. Native Americans used standing rock to identify the area. When early settlers arrived, they noticed the rock was used as a crossing point for an old Indian trail. I first saw this standing stone in the fall of 1804. At that time, there were two trees on top of it, a hemlock and a small pine. The top of the rock was higher than the banks on either side and covered with huckleberry bushes and moss. The Indians had felled a small sapling from the shore to the rock, forming what was called an Indian ladder. By this means, they could climb onto the top. Whenever an Indian family passed by here, they would climb on the rock and fasten a piece of bark to the hemlock, pointing the direction they had gone. After the Revolutionary War, the United States government sent scouts to explore its newly acquired Northwest Territory. One of these early explorers was Captain Samuel Brady. As the story goes, Native Americans once pursued him for invading their land. While running from them, he jumped over the Cuyahoga River and hid in a lake to escape capture. That lake is now Brady Lake, which was later named after Captain Brady. Well, Captain Brady is a very famous person around here, and of course Brady's Leap is one of the famous spots in the city of Kent, but there's some contention as to whether it ever happened because the uh, same exact story is taking place in a location in Pennsylvania. The same Captain Brady leaped over a river there and then hid in the lake until the Indians were bypassed or bypassed him. And uh, there's some indication that the story might be a fabrication. So uh, there's really not a way to prove it. There was a Captain Brady. He was an actual person. He was in this area, we all know that. If he jumped at all, the area where he jumped is totally different now from what it was then. In order to get through, that's the east side of the river there is solid rock, and you can't dig a canal with a pick and shovel in solid rock. They drilled all these holes and blasted the rock out with black powder, and the river today in that location is nothing like what it would have been had Captain Brady jumped. When the colonies were first settled, no one knew how big America really was. The area, which is now Northeast Ohio, fell under the borders of Connecticut. After the Revolutionary War, Connecticut sold its Northwest property to the Connecticut Land Company. The company put together an expedition to survey the land. The expedition was led by Moses Cleveland. After the land was surveyed, it was sold in a lottery, and the area, which is now Kent, was sold to Aaron Olmsted. He named the township Franklin in honor of his son. The village was separated into the upper village of Carthage and the lower village of Franklin Mills. The Cuyahoga River drew early settlers to the new township of Franklin. The water power created by the river could power mills, and where there were mills, there was soon a thriving settlement. The first settler to realize Franklin's potential as a mill town was Jacob Haymaker. He arrived in 1805, and after buying land from Aaron Olmsted, he moved his family to Franklin and began work on a dam. After the dam was built, the Haymakers began work on a grain mill. The mill was completed in 1808, 
and by 1810 the township's population rose to nearly 40 people. Soon other millers came to Franklin. In the spring of 1818, a miller named Joshua Woodard settled in the upper village of Carthage. He built a woolen factory and dye house on the river where the Crane Avenue Bridge is today. Travel was difficult in the early days of Franklin Mills. There were very few roads. The roads were very, very poor. They were dirt and just uh, a track through the woods. They'd cut trees off so that the axle of a wagon would clear the stump. The people in Ohio started to question their legislators about, you know, how about a canal for Ohio here? We need that. And eventually a law was passed, funding was arranged, and they started in 1825. And uh, by 1827, uh, the Ohio and Erie that ran from uh, Cleveland to Portsmouth was finished from uh, Akron to Cleveland. By 1831, the whole canal was finished. This was all dug with a pick and a shovel and a wheelbarrow. They had no mechanical equipment of any kind. So the canal was a, a fulcrum that everything balanced on until it came. Uh, they had nothing, and after it came, they had, quote, everything. While the canals were being built, the land value of Franklin Mills soared. People began looking at the water power potential of the village. It was during this time that Zenas Kent came in search of water power investments. He came to Manaway first and then went back and got his wife when they, and they settled in Hudson. Shortly thereafter they moved to, Man to Ravana where he uh, got into the basically construction work, built many town, many buildings in Kent or in Nirvana, and including the courthouse. And after a short time, then he came to Kent and proceeded to do basically the same thing. He and uh, David Land bought 50, 500 to 600 acres of land in Franklin Township for about $6,300, which included the Cahoga River because they wanted to build a mill, a flour mill on the river, which they did, which manufactured the flour, shipped it to Cleveland via the Ohio Canal. Soon after, a group of investors called the Franklin Land Company paid a great deal of money for Zenas Kent's riverfront property. They had come up with a way to turn Franklin Mills into one of the foremost manufacturing centers in the country. The Franklin Land Company became the Franklin Silk Company and started building a large silk factory below the new dam. Then, in 1837, a depression hit the country. Many people went bankrupt, but not Zenas Kent. He took the profit he made from the sale of his water power property, built a hotel called the Franklin Exchange, and bought back his original water power properties. He also built a flour mill and tannery, in which he went into business with John Brown. Kent later severed ties with Brown because of his eccentric tendencies. While the canals were thriving in Franklin Mills, some residents were aiding runaway slaves on their perilous journey to freedom. Well, Franklin Mills played a considerable role in the Underground Railroad in that they, they had a number of stations and uh, slaves moving up, mostly out of western Virginia, would have come up through the Portage area, some going through Ravenna, some going through Kent and so forth. They would have needed places to stop. And these stopping places would have been called stations and the people that controlled them were the conductors. Many prominent people from Portage County, especially the Kent area, that had formed a committee. The committee's sole purpose was to get uh, fugitive slaves, what they call passengers or baggage, get them safely through their area and to Cleveland. Cleveland was called Hope. Of course, Canada was called Heaven. Jonathan James, the proprietor of a local tavern called the Cuyahoga House, helped slaves along what later became known as the Underground Railroad. Well, the Cuyahoga House was a large hotel, a tavern, restaurant, and so forth. Uh, it was kind of located between the two little cities, upper and lower uh, Franklin Mills. It was an abolitionist house to begin with. It had secret rooms. It had large rooms, they had plenty of food to feed the runaways. They would bring slaves in and they would hide them and uh, take care of them, maybe supply them with food and so forth. John Brown, a former business partner of Zenas Kent, was another Franklin Mills resident opposed to slavery. 
Brown became an adamant abolitionist, and in 1859 he was captured after raiding a government arsenal in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Brown was hanged for treason in Virginia, and his trial created a lot of political controversy before the Civil War. The Underground Railroad was a secret organization. John Brown was anything but secret. Now, he lent his support to all endeavors to end slavery. He was an abolitionist. Uh, what he had to do with the day-to-day -day operation, I do not know. But he worked with Kent and other people. He was right in the middle of it, right at the high tide of the Underground Railroad going through. He must have led his support in many ways, but uh, exactly what he did, I am not sure. He probably aided them more in the things that he did better, mainly speaker. He was a speaker. During the Civil War, the railroad came to Franklin Mills. In the mid-1800s, the railroad was changing the face of the country. By the 1860s, the railroad replaced the canal system. And by 1869, the canal in Kent was abandoned and allowed to drain. The railroad started in in the 1850s. The railroad was much faster, and it could run all year round. The canal was tied up by ice for three or four months every uh, winter, and things pretty well stopped. With the coming of the railroad, you could uh, move all year round. The canal lasted uh, another 20, 30 years after the railroads came hauling mostly bulk goods, coal, gravel, sand, things of that nature. Anything that was uh, like grain, uh, farm products, was moved now by railroad because the canal boat was too slow. Marvin Kent ensured that not only would Franklin Mills be a stop for the railroad, but it would also house a repair shop. The tracks for the Atlantic and Great Western Railroad were laid in February of 1863, and the first passenger train came through town one month later. The railroad brought a period of prosperity to the city of Kent. Many business buildings and houses were built during this era. It was the largest industry in the city. There were hundreds of men worked here. Once the shops were put in, Kent himself was instrumental in having the shops put here in Kent. They built cars, repaired cars, repaired locomotives, and uh, it was a big, big operation. Well, the railroad brought business and industry as well as people to the community, including my own grandparents. Um, the railroad shops were brought to Kent with Mr. Kent's efforts. Actually, it was Frank and Mills at the time. And as it progressed and later became the Erie Railroad, it became the largest employer in this Kent for about 50 years. Another key business in Kent's history is the Davy Tree Expert Company. The company was started in 1901 after John Davy wrote a book called The Tree Doctor. Before Davy, trees were just cut down. No one put any thought into healing or saving them. Davy put together a group of workers and spread his business to Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and New York. The business grew into a multi-million dollar operation and is still in service today. It was during this industrial and civic boom that Kent received a college. In the early 1900s, Ohio was faced with a shortage of teachers. The state passed a law to build two colleges to train teachers. The state decided to build a school in both the western and eastern part of Ohio. After the Western College was built in Bowling Green, everyone in the East wanted their town to be picked for the other school. William Kent, of course, was Marvin's son, and he was a big advocate to the state legislature, so he organized the local support, lobbied the legislature, and eventually the legislative body, the group that was to pick the site, came to Northeastern Ohio and looked at sites. When they came to Kent, William had organized the business people, uh, the local uh, children were asked to sit out on the curb so that they could show that there was all these children that were available to go to this normal school if they would develop it here. Kent offered to donate a large portion of land to the college, and as a result, the state decided to build the Eastern School in Kent. Over the years, the college's name changed from Kent State Normal School to Kent State College and eventually to Kent State University. After the university was established, the building blocks were in place for the modern city of Kent. The city has experienced everything from glaciers to the Native Americans, the early settlers, the canals, the railroad, 
and at the heart of it all, the Cuyahoga River. It was these early years that helped shape Kent into the city it is today.